It is my absolute pleasure to introduce Laura Newman Eckstein to speak with us tonight about the Cairo Geniza project called Scribes of the Cairo Geniza. I have been lucky enough to know Laura since I first moved to Portland about 13 years ago. And I have to say there's a special sweetness in um, getting to learn from a formal, former student. As many of you know, Laura grew up here in Portland. Um, and as a product of Portland Jewish Academy, Neve Shalom, the Downstairs Minion, um, our Tijon program here, um, and many close relationships with her family and her community. She continued her interest personally, academically, and politically in Jewish studies. Laura earned her BA in religion at Haverford College, and from there began her position as the Judaica Digital Humanities Coordinator at the University of Pennsylvania, which is where she studied the Cairo Geniza fragments. Currently, Laura is a PhD candidate in early Atlantic Jewish history at UPenn. I'll let Laura introduce her topic, but one of the things I've found fascinating following her uh, in the various projects that she's engaged in is that I feel like she truly represents the best of her generation, bringing new tools to both contemporary and historic studies. Whether using digital maps to study current political sociology or crowdsourcing to study the Cairo Geniza fragments, um, what she's doing is really representing the changing face of how we can learn and how we can engage, whether with primary sources or with the changing world around us. And I think that's part of the story that Laura is going to present. So please help me welcome Laura Newman Eckstein. Okay, so first I want to say thank you to Mel and thank you to everybody who helped put this on, including my parents who sort of started this initiative. Um, and thank you to all of you for coming. It's really overwhelming to come back and to have this big crowd here. So today I'm going to be talking about a project called Scribes of the Cairo Geniza. And as Mel said, I now am a first year PhD student at the University of Pennsylvania. But previously, I worked as the Judaica Digital Humanities Coordinator at the University of Pennsylvania Libraries. And as part of that position, I worked with the digital collections held by Penn um, in their Judaica collection. And I tried to make those collections more accessible and interesting for the public. And so this is one of those initiatives. Um, and Scribes of the Cairo Geniza came out of the Geniza collection that we have at Penn. So um, first, I'm just gonna give you a little bit of an outline of what I'm going to discuss, and then we'll dive right in. So I'm going to, for those who don't know what a Geniza is, I'm going to talk a little bit just about what it is. Then I'm going to tell you about what the Cairo Geniza is specifically, and why it's interesting for scholars, and what problems and challenges it poses for scholars. Um, and why those problems and challenges make it interesting and why our project helps to resolve, or we think it helps to resolve, some of those problems and challenges. And then finally, I'm going to take you through our project. So let's get started. So first, what is a Geniza? So a Geniza is a temporary repository for unusable Hebrew texts um, containing God's name. And they're placed there before they're buried. And the practice originates from the idea that God's name is sacred um, in the Jewish tradition. And so you may have a sidur, a prayer book, right, that is unusable. You've used it a lot. And so you don't just throw it away. 
you put it in a Geniza, and then ultimately it will be buried. And there are Genizot all over the world, even today. Nevishalom, I'm assuming, has one, right? Um, the interesting thing about the Cairo Geniza, right, is that the Jews of Cairo never ended up burying most of their documents. So they left them in their Geniza, which was an attic, um, oh, sorry, which was an attic in their um, synagogue, um, which is located in Fustat, Egypt, today known as Old Cairo. And in the late 19th century, um, various Orientalists um, who, are, who are sort of these professors searching for um, documents of sort of exotic, um, exotic nature went to various places in the East. And they, one of the places they went was um, this attic or they found them because, found the documents um, and they bought them off of traders and um, they took them out of the attic in the Ben Ezra synagogue. And so today the corpus of these documents is spread throughout various institutions. So, the documents are no longer in the attic. They're found at Cambridge, JTS, Oxford, the British Library, HUC, they're in Moscow, and what I worked on, um, Penn. So the corpus numbers approximately 300,000 fragments, um, and they date mostly from the 10th through 13th centuries, although they go up until the 19th, centuries, 19th century. And, um, in addition to being interested in why these, why these fragments were never buried, um, these documents also pose some other um, fascinating questions and intrigue. So these documents are not only religious, but they also are everyday texts. So we also, besides sort of the ketubot marriage contracts that you might see or prayer books that you might see, we also have recipes and receipt books and tax forms. We have any sort of daily life material that you can think of from these medieval and pre-modern times. Um, in addition, besides sort of that everyday intrigue, the 10th through 13th century happens to coincide with the height of the Fatimid Caliphate. A caliphate is just an Islamic state. And the height of this um, empire um, this ca caliphate extended throughout northern Africa, up into Sicily, down into Saudi Arabia, and up into Iraq and parts of Turkey. So it was a vast empire. And at its capital was Cairo. And the Geniza reflects this. So we have documents from as far north as parts of France and as far east as India. And we see this also reflected in the many different handwriting styles and languages. We have, not only do we have Arabic and Hebrew languages, but we also have Judeo-Persian, Arabo-Hebrew, um, Judeo-Arabic. So when I say Judeo-Arabic, what I mean is Arabic written in Hebrew script. Arabo-Hebrew is the reverse, right? Um, so you have all these various combinations that are complicated in language form. And then on top of that, right, those are just the languages, but then on top of that, you have the way they're written, right? So they're the alphabets, which can be in Arabic and Hebrew, um, that's the majority. And then on top of that, right, if people are writing just an everyday document, like you write a shopping list, right? You're not gonna write it in your nicest formal handwriting. You're gonna write it in sort of an everyday scrawl. And so we don't see sort of documents that are easily decipherable. So today for scholars, this proves a large challenge. So what you have is a corpus that is really compelling because it tells you a lot about a time that we actually don't know that much about. And it tells you about a geography that we don't know that much about. But we can't decipher it very easily because of the variety of different handwriting styles and script types. Um, and so we think that we may have um, found a solution. Before I get to that, um, let me show you a few samples so you can sort of get a picture. Um, so on your right, you'll see a sample from Penn's collection. 
Um, this is a legal document. Let me see if I can do this. Hold on. Okay. So you can see here, do you see this seal? Like, if you can't see it right now that well, but it's a seal. You can trust me. Um, and there's a seal down here as well. Okay. And we, we know it's a legal document because of that. Um, there's a similar, like, structure on the back of the document. Um, but we don't actually know that much more about the document yet. Um, I'm going to continue on with a few more samples just to give you a feel of some Geniza documents so you can get a sense. Um, this is a shopping list. Um, I'm not sure the language, but you can tell, I can see just from my own eyes that it's in um, Hebrew script, so in a Hebrew alphabet, right? So it could be in other languages besides Hebrew. But I know from scholars um, who've looked at this that it contains um, saffron and fish on the list. So <laughs> they were also getting their sight. Spices on and fish on. Okay, so continuing on. Here is a ketubah, a marriage contract. Um, and this is Italian. It's just part of it. Um, and so, obviously, it's a fancier handwriting style. Um, but so this is sort of, you can see sort of the, the part of the extent of the various handwriting styles, right? Um, And then here is just a random document somebody found um, online from the JTS collection. You can see how things are cut out. We're not really sure why. There's Arabic, uh, possibly Hebrew letters going across. It's a mystery. Um, a few more, just quickly. This is Had God Ya, like it's a... If you're not familiar, it's, we find this in, the, in our Seder, or in our Passover Seder. It's in Judeo-Persian. Um, you can see the goats that are at the top, that were scrolled at the top. It's from a larger, bounded um, Haggadah text that was found in the Geniza. Um, I'm going to skip to this one because it just... Okay, and then finally, so this is an example of a much harder um, uh, to decipher text, right? So you have Arabic, right? Here's the Arabic scroll. And it's probably a decree, just from now my experience, but a decree written. And then here's Hebrew text, right? So somebody reused the paper um, is probably what the deal is, or... I don't know what the other, I, I, there's probably some other idea, but anyway, the, the point is um, you can see the complexity of various sort of hand writing styles and also alphabets um, and languages. So this is to just give you a sense. Um, so since the 19th century, these or when these Orientalists came and removed fragments from this attic, this Geniza, um, approximately one-third of these 300,000 fragments have been cataloged, and even less have been transcribed due to the many different handwriting styles that you've seen um, in the various languages, because you have to learn all of these languages, and then you have to learn how to transcribe the various different handwriting styles. Um, here you can see on the right is a picture of Solomon Schechter, who was at Cambridge, um, during when they got many of their Geniza fragments, and he's at work with his plunder of Geniza fragments um, in 1898. So a solution. So um, I'm going to give you a bit of a timeline about a pro this proposed solution that we had for this problem. So Penn has a collection of approximately 700 Geniza fragments. And as part of my job, my job was to figure out a way for people to interact with these Geniza fragments. And so we wanted users to be able to um, read them in some form um, and learn from them. And so in the winter of 2017, Zooniverse, the largest crowdsourcing um, platform in the world, 
um, sent, sent out a call for transcription projects that were, for transcription projects that were particularly difficult. So for those texts that were difficult to transcribe. And what was better than a Cairo Geniza fragment? Um, and so we, we applied and we won. Um, and so in August of 2017, we launched a sorting phase with 30,000 fragments. In the meantime, let me just say, um, we had gotten JTS, um, Cambridge, and others to partner with us. Um, not only so, so that others, not only Penn's collection could uh, be part of this project, but others could be a participate. In May 2018, we finished the sorting phase and we began an additional sorting phase with 22,000 of fragments. And then now, um, probably in a month or so, we will launch a transcription phase. So right now, this is the part of the presentation where I'm going to take you um, through each, the sorting and then um, sort of the transcription phase and you'll get to see how it all works. So um, we realized that before transcription, even though the goal was to transcribe each of these fragments, right, we needed to know a little bit more about each fragment before we could begin to ask people to transcribe. You have to realize that Zooniverse is a community of almost three million users who, have, who are, the whole point is that you have no experience going in, so you need to sort of give them some baseline to work with. So we started using this, they have a project builder, um, which anybody can go on and sort of start a crowdsourcing project. And we asked people to sort these fragments into categories based on their script type, so their alphabet, right? Whether they're an Arabic, an Arabic alphabet or a Hebrew alphabet. Whether they have sort of a formal style of handwriting or an informal style of handwriting or both. And then certain visual characteristics. So whether they have colons or seals um, or diagonal or marginal texts, and then whether there's evidence of binding. Um, Steve. Hi, sorry to interrupt. Can you just define this whole portion about crowdsourcing in general? What is that? Yeah, sure. I can give a little bit more information on that. Um, so crowdsourcing is this idea that you can have um, large numbers of people come together, um, learn from one another, um, and participate as a collective community to solve problems such as transcribing and sorting Cairo Geniza fragments. So, <laughs> um, there's, while there's efforts like there, I'm aware of Amazon and Google using crowdsourcing in order to like in a monetary manner, Zooniverse is a nonprofit, or is it's all sort of volunteer-based crowdsourcing efforts, um, and they do mostly science-based projects, but they do have a few um, non-science-based projects, and so they help scientists and researchers with um, large sets of data in order to um, process and. Um, and sort through it all, I should say. Does that answer your question? It's all online, it's zooniverse.org. So, um, to get us, yes, okay, so, we were, yeah, so here, these are the different um, ways that we sorted the fragments. So I'm just gonna give you a quick example, sort of to contextualize how this works. So if you think about when you, if you went into an office, right, um, and you took a miscellaneous sampling of paper um, off the desk, you would probably find checks and business cards, right, envelopes and letters, right? Um, and these various things contain um, a format. So even though for the purposes of this exercise, let's say we are not, we don't know English, right? We know that a business card tends to be a certain dimension. And we know that an envelope tends to have a flap, right? And so through these different visual characteristics, despite not knowing the language and despite not knowing what is on the envelope, 
or what is on the business card, we can deduce from visual characteristics what these various items are, right? And so through our scholar, we have figured out ways to deduce what these various documents are. We found different clues, visual clues, to help us figure out what these documents are. And so without having any expertise, you can help us sort through these fragments. So I'm gonna take you and show you how this works. Okay, so sorry if I'm blocking people, but I'll just kneel. Okay, so here you have, um, here you have our project and we ask you, it's not normally so small if you're not giving a presentation, but we have a fragment here, the recto verso, front back. And we ask you, in what script is this text written? So if you need some help, um, we offer some help with a bunch of examples. So you don't need any experience in the languages. You just need to have eyes, uh, right? And then, here, I know it's Hebrew script, right? Then I decide whether it's formal or informal. This one's a little more tricky, I think, but I'm gonna call it formal, um, probably. Yeah, it's, well, yeah, for the purposes. And then we ask about evidence of binding. Are there justified margins, top corner page wear? There is, there is. I, don't know, but let's just say I did that right. And then we ask about a few other things. And then you press done, and you're taken to the next fragment. Okay? And we've had some amazing results. Sorry, yeah. Right, so we have five, pe five different people look at the same fragment before it's considered done. Um, and then, and we've had, I don't know what the percentage is, but I've looked at the results and they're highly accurate. Um, like via spot check. I mean, we've had 20, 228,000 plus, you'll see the results, um, people, do that rendition. Yeah, so I can't go through every one of those. Yes? I have more slides, but you can ask a question. It doesn't matter. Oh, sure. I mean, we'll take whatever we can get, essentially. Um, there's no criteria. The, the reason why there are shopping lists and receipts within the Cairo Geniza, I mean, sorry, I didn't mention this, but that's part of the mystery. Like, we think, scholars think that's because, just like today, you may be bad at sorting your recycling versus garbage, right? They were bad at sorting through their various papers and decided, like, it's not that important. We're just going to put it all up there. Right? Or it is important enough, I guess, maybe, that we're going to put it all up there in another way to look at it, right? So that's why, that's why there are shopping lists with prayer books, right? Um, it's great for us. But the, the reason why we have what we have is because various institutions have partnered with us and they've agreed for X number of images or all of their images, and that's why these are there. Yes. So essentially passed, they can be erased and reused. 
So I can't tell you how many are wiped out and written over because I don't know of anybody who's gone through the entire Geniza. That's like kind of a, I mean, I can't tell you that, um, just to be honest. But your second question about um, parchment versus paper, it's a combination of both. Um, but I would say the majority are on paper. Okay. I'm not going to be able to answer that, but I can find the answer for you and get back to you. <laughs> okay. So, using the data gathered, let's see, we're going to keep going. Um, we now have fragments that are sorted into piles. So, we've gotten sort of some data out of this, right? Um, we know what script. The, docu the fragments are written in. We know if it's an Arabic or Hebrew script. Um, and we know whether it's sort of a difficult to read hand, like how they wrote, or if it's, if it's harder, what we're calling formal or informal, easy, hard. Um, and so what we realize is that if it's a really difficult thing to read, we, can't, we still can't ask somebody to just start transcribing it. That's just not going to work um, based on some tests we ran. And so what we decided to do is before we send it to uh, transcription immediately, um, we needed to um, sort of have a sub-step where we ask people to look for certain keywords. Um, and so these keywords are found within the first seven lines of the document and tell us about the genre of each document. Um, and so ultimately when these are transcribed, these documents, they show up as sort of these hints overlay on an overlay um, in the transcription interface, which you'll see and it will be more evident. Um, but let me go back to sort of our example of the office for a moment, if I may. Um, so if we continue with that example, um, let's say you find um, a group of documents and they all start with the same word and you ha and you're and they all start with the same word that you happen to be able to decipher, you happen to be able to read, and they all start with the word with the word dear, right? And there's something afterwards, and you can't tell what it is, and then there's a comma, and then there's something else, and whatever, right? Well, you happen to know that dear and something and then a comma probably means that that is a letter, right? And because of that, you can begin to see how that person shapes their D, the letter D, the letter E, the letter A, and the letter R, right? And so in that sort of same um, thought process, we came up with a list of genres such as letters, testimonies, petitions, and tax forms, and found sort of common words that you find within this first seven, le seven lines and found, and with those words, found things that people can pull out, sort of like with a rectangle, which you'll see, rectangle box, um, so that it will be easier when people begin to transcribe. They'll have sort of a letter, a, a scribe, scribe's handwriting reference, right? Um, so how those scribes form their, form their letters. Um, so I'm going to show you how that works. difficult to see a little bit on the screen, but um, 
So we ask you to find, if you can, one of these sort of seven key, or maybe now it's four key words, um, if you can, within the first seven lines of the document. Um, and so these tell us a little bit about the document's uh, genre, and also will give you a clue when you begin to transcribe, as I said. So um, I actually don't remember if this has anything on it, and we're not, we just don't have time to like look through it carefully. But let's say for the purposes of this exercise that this is the word that we find on the document, right? Um, then you press next, and then there's a common phrases that are associated with that word that you might find. So we've asked for you to look a little more carefully um, and see if you see these phrases associated with that word that, we, that you see. Um, and so let's say you've seen this phrase, okay? We ask you to put a box over it, right? So let's say that's the box. And we ask you to say, you just do next. And then you can say, I've marked all my keywords and now I'm finished. Now that, what? Oh, okay, yeah, I can. Um, so this, I'm not gonna pronounce it right because some of them are in Judeo-Arabic, so don't, I'm just gonna point at them, actually. Um, if I remember right, this is for a testimony. This is also for a testimony. This is for a letter, right? Um, this is for, this is actually for a religious document, um, because sometimes those get sorted into, it's like a check. Um, so that's, that's it's as much as I can tell you at the moment. Um, yeah, did someone, okay. I did not make his universe. I like set it all up, yes, and yeah. Um, okay. So just to keep going. So as I said, if the, if the fragments sort of in that first phase were classified as something that was sort of easy to read, they were, they're sent to like immediately transcription after they've been looked at five times. But if they're not, they're sent to this keyword thing that I showed you just now. And then they'll, after five times, once again, they'll be sent to transcription. Um, now I'm gonna, going to show you the transcription part, which is, I think, sort of the coolest part, right? It's what we won our grant for, and you'll see that. You'll see that reflected. Um, and you'll see that reflected in the special keyboards we made and in the crib sheets, the tutorials, the field guides, and then the other um, materials um, that help folks who don't know Arabic or Hebrew um, to transcribe. Um, the other thing that's important about this interface is that it's trilingual. So for people, these documents are not only reflective of a Jewish life, but they're also reflective of a Muslim world um, that was vibrant during this time. Um, so I think that this trilingual interface um, will be helpful for Hebrew and Arabic speakers. Um, Arabic, Hebrew, English. Okay, so here is our homepage, and then here are the various workflows, and you get a fragment. So I don't. bugs, obviously, okay. Okay, so this is better. Okay, so here you can zoom in, and let's say you want to transcribe the first line. You take your, like, added transcription, and you put your dots on one end of the area, 
and the other, and it's not normally like this. You'll be, the scale is better on your normal PC or Mac. But the point is, is that you get this text area, and you can type either on your keyboard or by pointing with your mouse, clicking with your mouse. Um, and there's also these divine, or these um, text modifiers, so if you see damaged text or whatever you see, you can add those in. The sort of baby or the coolest thing of my eye is um, these keyboards. So this fragment happens to have fairly easy to decipher, in my opinion, text. However, there is plenty of text that is difficult to decipher. So if for, by chance you may have more difficult to decipher text, you can go through, I think there are 18 keyboards, and pick out whichever one fits your text the best. Um, I'm gonna give you an example. So if everybody like looks right here where the, can everybody see what the mouse is doing? So this is an olive, and if you watch the olive as I move through, you'll see how the olive shape is similar at points, but also is very different. So there it is, right? There it is. There it is. Whoa, what you have, right? That's totally different. Right? That would be a difficult thought to just hear describe, right? And you can also hear describe it, it's wrong. So you can get to that too. Um, we also offer you like this. based off of a 1920s Egyptian um, typewriter keyboard. Um, so you can see the four forms um, if there are of the Arabic letters, the um, initial, medial, final, and isolated, so that if you're not familiar with Arabic, because the Arabic tends to sort of look like it does today, if it's not, you know, scrawled insanely. Yes? Yeah, anybody can. No. Nope. Oh, the question is, um, can anybody transcribe, like, do you have to have a certification? And my answer was, you do not need a certification. Anybody can transcribe. Um, so sort of that's, that's that. Um, so just to recap quickly. So at the beginning, uh, in the sorting phase, you start by just looking at sort of the script type. Um, you have either a document in Arabic script, Arabic or Hebrew script, or Hebrew script, usually. Um, and then you sort it into whether it's sort of this informal or formal hand, right? Um, there's also a few other things like these visual characteristics. But essentially, that's what you do. Um, oh, I can do this up here, right? Um, Based on that, you, you with the um, informal, harder things, you take those and you put them through this phrase finder, keyword finder, where you find different uh, phrases, if you can, to tell us about the genre, but also to tell us about how to decipher the letters within the document um, to have more accurate and easier transcription. <clears throat> And then finally, um, we get these categories of easily and challenging Arabic and easy and challenging Hebrew um, based off of all of that, um, which anybody can contribute to. Um, so I think the final thing that I wanted to show to everybody um, are these talk boards. Um, yes. <laughs> right, so optical character recognition scanning um, has been shown to be effective with Latin, um, like 
Latin characters. However, with this type of, um, these types of characters, I mean, it's, it's virtually impossible uh, because, particularly because there's so much, um, so many texts that have diagonal and marginal uh, texts, and also because there's sort of layering of texts. No. So, how long ago did you start? We started in the winter of 2017 when we won the grant, but we launched in May of 2017. So, it has nothing to do with the game, whether it's uh, six plus. I'm unfamiliar, maybe. Dead oh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, I'm sorry. Um, no, it has so nothing to do. This time I was just playing the Hecos Fragments. Right. Right, they're both fragmentary in nature, but no. Yeah, no problem. Oh, yes. Yeah, and also we've seen that people get better over time. And also people who sort before they begin transcribing are even better. Does your project Sorry. also include translation? No. No. Most are in Hebrew. Most are in Hebrew. I would say probably, okay, I don't want to say this. I would say um, to be safe, 50, uh, no, I would say to be safe, 75% are in Hebrew. Uh, Gloria. Oh, oh. Um, so in terms of like the image rights, so there are snafus with the image rights in terms of getting them from people, and we can talk about that privately. Um, but um, but Penn has a position. So Penn is the one who contracts with the various institutions, and so Penn's position is that they believe in democratizing data. So they believe in giving the highest quality data to anybody and having it be open to anybody. And so we have made all of our Geniza fragments, if you go on to the site, like you can Google it, open. Um, you can download TIFFs, which are like high quality images of our Geniza fragments and zoom into like the tiniest bit. Um, and so we don't mind, we're happy if you write an article on our Geniza fragments. We think that anybody should be able to. That's okay. That's part of the license. Yes. These are not the highest quality, just to let you know. But we at Penn, it's okay. Yes. Mel, you read my mind. <laughs> okay. Okay, so um, we have these things that are called the talk boards, um, and they're sort of this forum, and we, on the back end, sort of like the, the people who are working on this project, we're not excited about these. We thought they were sort of a waste of time, but they've turned out to be some of the most sort of exciting things that are going on, and what they are are sort of things that, where people can um, ask questions and um, talk behind the scenes and get information both from our scholars as well as from each other. Um, and so we have hundreds of pages of people talking with one another about these fragments. People who have no experience, some people who do, but some people who have no experience in the Cairo Geniza before this project. And we also have an introduction board, which you can go on and look at. Um, here we go. So, here we go. 
Um, I'll read one. Hi, uh, I'm Sarah. I have uh, slightly more than zero experience with Hebrew and Arabic, but I assure you it isn't much. I'm a student of the Hebrew scriptures, and I'm current learning, currently learning about the Old Testament poetry. How cool. I'm superbly excited to help with this project. Here's another one. I, hello, I'm Abigail, I, and I have dot, 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 no qualifications whatsoever to be doing this. I got an email, so I joined. Can't read a word of Hebrew, unfortunately, because it's probably interesting and looks clearly written a lot of, I don't know, written a lot of, a lot of to, the time of Shakespeare, unlike the Shakespeare manuscripts. But anyway, hi, I'm excited to help. I love Zooniverse in general. We have people from Cairo, from Australia. We have people from Israel and from all over working on this project. It's, so I can tell you, we, so I don't have the exact statistics, but I can show you where we are right now. So right now, um, sorry, right now, so that rendition that we went through at the beginning where we went through whether it's an Arabic or Hebrew script, that whole thing. So it's been done 212,827 times since May of 2017. Um, we've had 3,925 volunteers sign up. It doesn't mean that people, you can go online, do this, and not sign up for Zooniverse, and you won't necessarily be part of that number, right? And we have... 37,375 out of the 40,000 blah, 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 subjects, which are the back and front, those images, finish. Um, so unlike one scholar who can sort of go through, you know, I don't know, seven, I'm not going to say a number, but who can go through a small number of these documents, slowly and carefully, granted, but in a year. This project can sort of take a corpus in mass and have volunteers do it. And what we've seen with results that are accurate and do it quickly or fairly quickly, right? Since May of 2017, all of this has happened. And we have a ways to go. We have to have them transcribed. But I think that this definitely says something about sort of how you can take digital technology and mesh, mesh it with um, sort of these old and interesting documents and, um, and sort of these antiquity. Uh, uh, well, question. Ideas. Yeah. So we have a, obviously, because five people have to go through it, there's a, I mean, there has to be a majority rule, right? So three, two, but if it's three, two, which often, most of the time it's not, I mean, I, I look at the data all the time, and most of the time it's, if there's a, a conflict, it's going to be a four, one, if that makes sense. So like one person says that will, if it's, if there is a conflict, it will be one person says it's Arabic, four people say it's Hebrew. And we're not worried about that. We trust that it's going to be Hebrew. If it's a 3-2, we tend to look at that document. Um, so that's how we deal with it. Um, but there aren't actually that many of those. And also we gain insight in, from that. We actually, um, there are certain script types that come up over and over and over that are more difficult for people, right? Like there's this Northern African script type that's particularly difficult. So, yes. So this is a transcription project. Do you, as an ANDF, how many research papers and new discoveries have you generated by completed your subjects? Not one. Not, I mean, it's just started, right? So um, it's very fresh. Nothing has happened yet. Really? Yes. So did you say that the penalties will result clear out of all these, these documents? Um, because I remember being there in 1985, seeing there were still documents in the uh, Cairo Geniza. Uh, so these 
yeah, I can speak to that. So interestingly enough, um, there was an article that was just published in the Jewish Quarterly Review by, I'm going to blink on the name, but at, she's from Florida, like University of Florida, and she just published an article about how there are still like fragments left there um, that were sort of unbeknownst to the sort of foremost scholars in the field. Um, and so while we say that there are 300,000 fragments, there may be more, obviously. Um, and I don't know if you saw, but I had like a little note at the bottom um, that said, see Jewish Quarterly Review, <laughs> there may be more. Um, but so I don't contest that. And have you been to the Cairo Museum in, in Cairo? Nope. The various institutions. So Cambridge owns theirs, Penn Libraries owns ours. Are all the fragments text or are there artwork or diagrams? Yeah, I can show you some if you're interested. Here, this is one of the things that I wanted to show you that I thought was interesting. So one of the things that I like about the talk boards is the ability for people to teach scholars about what they know using their own knowledge. So here we have a fragment. Can people see this or here? I'll make this a little bigger. Um, so you can see the detail, okay? Right? So if I were to look at this, I really would not know what this is. This is from the JTS um, collection, okay? So somebody came across this, and we have diagrams all the time. Um, there's sort of these, um, I forget what they're called, but there are things dealing with sort of like this magical um, thing that they believed in. Anyway, this woman wrote, I think this is a textile design. Um, she goes, the dot's showing a color. My grandfather was a carpet restorer who learned his craft in Cairo, and he did des his designs like this on graph paper. So you learn... Our scholars learned from this. Yeah, no problem. Um, if you want, I can zoom, zoom out just a bit. Is that better? Yes. So on the t so it's a little more complicated at the moment, but it will be. Okay. And my second question but, is, yeah. if you're a fourth year PhD student, you're going to worry about integrator reliability if you're using this for your primary source data, right? Because you're going to get skewered by your committee if you don't produce that information. Yeah. So what algorithms or um, internal structure have you put into this sort of database that can analyze integrator reliabilities? Right, no, I know exactly what you mean by that. Um, <laughs> um, so we're working on those algorithms at the moment. Um, and essentially what, we're, what our plan is, is we're going to create a sort of open access web page where people can see all those algorithms, which I can't really discuss right now sure. because I'm not totally familiar with what's going on on that end. Um, However, I am familiar with some of the sorting things. But the other thing that I can tell you is that in terms of your first question about the second year PhD, um, that I'm more familiar with. And you can go through and search, uh, for example, if you have like a tag. So all of these documents that people have gone through, if they have commented on them and they've sort of, you can use a hashtag. So people have like hashtag drawings, right? It's not as specific as we would like, right? And it's sort of, if somebody happens to do it. But what we are going to do is with this data, we're going to put it into a database. And that's gonna be freely accessible and open to the public. Um, and so anybody can use it. Um, and I think the plan is for the transcriptions is that people can see the various transcriptions that were sort of proposed and they can make their assumptions. 
um, based on, on that. Um, but hopefully it's a start. We're not sort of trying to say like this is right necessarily. We're trying to say like hopefully this helps you. So um, a few answers to that. So there's a theory that the um, calcium carbonate in the air in Cairo that is, comes off the cliffs, I guess, I have not been to Cairo, as I said, but helps to keep the temperature, uh, humidity in the air sort of at a constant or something, like not, not a chemistry person, but I can tell you that that is a theory that um, one of the researchers at the Princeton Geniza lab has, um, and, I, and they do have a theory that the humidity in the air is sort of consistent, which is helpful, because you don't want sort of this fluctuating humidity. There is bug damage, of course, but it's not extensive, and they are preserved very well. Um, today, um, they're preserved in sort of what you would consider sort of state-of-the-art preservation techniques, um, and right now the JTS uh, materials were just rehoused and rephotographed at the Princeton Geniza lab um, at Princeton, obviously. <laughs> yeah. No, they don't. Um, I mean, they, some, some do, but also we have this help text, which I showed, I'm happy to show it again. Do you like to see it? Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Can you repeat the question? Um, oh. es essentially, how do people with no experience... Um, yeah, oh, no, that's not it. It's this, which is, right... Um, how do people with no experience ever begin to sort of answer a question, like, in what script is this text written? Yes. Is there any concern that the Egyptian government might assert that these documents were wrongly taken or sold and try to get them back? No. I don't, I mean, that has not been a concern, and I know that there have been concerns about other governments. So, about other governments with other collections. So, I'm not worried about that at the moment. Yeah, sorry, I apologize. Yeah, so we're also in touch, so we're in touch not only with people who sort of um, look, there's a project called Ancient Lives, which looks at transcribing um, ancient Greek and Roman, or ancient Greek, I think, papyri, um, if I remember right. Um, and they sort of use a similar technique, um, and they sort of also helped us get to Zooniverse. Um, but we also are in touch with people who are sort of in the historical crowdsourcing world, um, sort of to understand how to best use our, part of, one of the things that we really think about is how to best use our volunteers' time. So we don't want to waste your time when you're on our site. Um, we don't want you to be doing double work. Um, and so we're trying to figure out how to most effectively use your time and also how to most effectively um, think about going through these different workflows and sort of getting you to getting you to where we want you to be and getting the product that we want. Um, so we eventually want transcription. How do we get there? Well, we get there by doing these various different steps in a very methodolo methodological way. Um, and so we had to really think through that, and part of thinking through that was sort of talking to these various different 
folks. Yeah, thanks for asking that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we find joints all the time. Um, so there was work done by the Friedberg Geniza Project and Ronnie Schwecka, I think that's his name, um, to sort of, he developed a program to sort of look at the images. It's cool. Invite him. Um, but look at the images and highlight them um, and then try to find joins by sort of highlighting them and seeing the images and then seeing if you could match up the images. Um, that sort of ran its course. Um, but they found a lot of joins. Now people are finding in our project joins based off of what they're seeing um, just with eyesight, right? Um, and so, yeah, we do find things that are match up that are in various collections, like ones in JTS and ones at Penn, or ones at JTS and ones at the Bodleian. Oh, okay. Um, some are written on parchment, but a majority are written on paper. Yes. Um, I looked at the blurb promoting your talk today, and I clicked on the site, and it says for Hebrew, easy, soon to come, soon to come. Is it already accessible? So the, as I said, um, the, the transcription part is soon to come. It will it will be coming in about a month. Yet there are volunteers already. Right, for the sorting phase? I'm sorry? For our sorting phase. I see. Yes. Yeah. So I have a question. You listed all the places where um, part of the, they're held. Yeah. And then you had Moscow, and that looked like an asterisk. So I, I oh. got a whole place, but I don't understand how they got to Moscow. Oh, sorry. There was an asterisk for that caveat about that there still may be some in Egypt. Okay. Um, but the, how did they get to Moscow? Yeah. I forget his name. Um, but there's a, a large a large collection sort of in, in Russia um, at the National Library um, that's sort of held under wraps there from my understanding. Um, but it's, it's for, that's about as much as I know about it. Okay, because I knew everyplace else. I forgot about all Yeah, I, I don't, I mean, as you can sort of see as evidence from my answering of these questions, my expertise is not as much in sort of, my expertise is creating a digital project to, to unlock or help to unlock sort of a collection and, and particularly a Judaica collection. But, my expertise is not as much about necessarily the, um, I, I don't have a PhD in the Geniza yet, and I won't, <laughs> but yeah. Okay, so I think, oh yeah. At what point do you tell any of it to be um, So right now it has to go through five renditions of those questions being answered uh, by, ver by different people. Um, and once that's done, then um, it's considered complete. Yeah, it's ready for transcription or keywords, and then transcription. Correct. Yeah. Thanks. Yes. Right, so part of that is done in the keywords, right? Because you're, the keywords are evidence of various genres, right? So, but no, not, I mean, that's sort of a limitation. We wish we could. There's, a pun, there's, there's many sort of wishes that we had and we had to sort of work within the limitations of Zooniverse and sort of building the project out of, um, their, their project builder, um, but also the grant. And there's only so much money that you have. Um, and so we couldn't, that was a wish and that wasn't fulfilled. 
Yes. How'd you get interested in this? So actually, it's not was not an interest of mine. But my first, <laughs> but my first meeting on my first day at the job was we need to you need to find a way to have people be able to read these. Um, and I had no idea. I don't even know if I knew what the Cairo Geniza was. And so, or I, I mean, I had heard of it, but really, I didn't know what it was. So. People kept mentioning Zooniverse, so finally I just decided, okay, fine, I'm just gonna email these people. And they told me they had a grant application open, and so I decided to apply. And the rest is history. <laughs> yes. Oh. So, Aren't you curious what she's going to come back and talk about in five years when she's done with her PhD? <laughs> I, want to, I want to thank everybody for coming this evening. I want to thank Lisa and Jerry Eckstein for providing refreshments outside. And please um, give Laura a, a warm round of applause for her presentation. Today.